This document is a document that talks about how Patu works. As you may know, Patu is a, a set of applications and libraries, etc., that are used to pull data from remote hosts and then send them to a central server. There are a number of repositories surrounding Patu. There's a shared library. There's a set of agents as um, as a repo. Then we also have the Patu web front end as a means of being able to see the data in a more graphical format. When you look at the various repositories, it seems to be overwhelming. And and as a result of that, I wanted to make sure that we had some documentation so that everybody could understand what's happening. The overall architecture of Patu is one in which we have agents that only pull data and agents can be from all around the globe as long as they can have access through HTTP to a central Patu API server. And the API server receives the information from the various agents. And the API server also presents data to remote systems using another API. So the API server is the central Patu server, and it's a central repository that's called Patu. And it only does one thing, it only does API work. And the API that it presents out to the world for um, non-agents allows third parties to create web applications that can then retrieve the data and then present it for people to be used. I want to talk about the major components, as I mentioned before, we have the agents, and they just collect time series data. There's the API server, and then there's the web app server. The web app server uses the API. That does not mean that some third party couldn't come in and write their own better looking, fancier uh, web app server to do something that we haven't thought about. So we were trying as much as possible to make the whole thing open source and everybody can get a chance to do something. Now, at the moment, we're using templating for the web app server. Some people have mentioned that we could convert that into React. Sometime in the future, there could be a replacement for React. And rather than having to rewrite the whole web front end, we could just uh, let people use the new repository for the web app and then um, be able to do a relatively straightforward transition. I want to give you some background. There are some very important configuration file parameters that everybody should think about. In all the Patu daemons that are out there, they share a common file, and that's the patu.yaml file. And in that file, there are a number of directories that are really important to take into consideration. And the reason why they're important is because it's good for us when we are trying to do troubleshooting. There's a log directory in which all the status of messages can be found. And there's a Patu log for just general messages that are out there. So as much as possible, we try to capture exceptions. And if there's a well-known exception that we think the user can recover from by doing some sort of an action, then that is logged to patu.log. The patu API has another log. So all the patu API daemons log to a, to a central file, which is called patuapi.log. And you'll see HTTP type requests that are going on there. So all sorts of RESTful and GraphQL type queries will be there. So rather than checking your Apache daemon log or your Apache error log, you may also want to be checking the patu-api log just in case. And then of course, there's a patu daemon log. And that is just the log that provides us with information when the daemons start. And it's the, it is just the log file for Python Flask. When the, all the daemons start up, by default, we try and log the, conf, the current Flask configuration into this file just for logging and uh, just general information. And then also, if there are any sorts of exceptions that happen due to any type of query or post, they will be found in this file. All of these three files are really good to look at for information. And then there's the daemon directory, and, and this stores data that needs to survive reboots. And one of those important pieces of information is the agent ID. At the moment, the way put two agents work is that they start up, they generate a random string, which is the which is what they use as an agent ID. It's a long hex string, and it stores it in a file in the daemon directory. And so if my agent is named Peter, there will be a file under the daemon directory, more than likely daemon directory slash agent ID slash Peter dot ID. And in there will be that that long hash string. And when the agents post to the central API server, they will include that hash string in there. 
and that is how the agents are uniquely identified from around the world. And so if, for example, you delete that daemon directory, the agent will come up and realize the daemon directory isn't there, it may crash. If the subdirectory isn't there, the daemon will automatically try to recreate it and generate a brand new agent ID. And so now the agent that would have been running on this from the same remote server will be sending data back to the central API server with a brand new agent ID. And so that will mean that the central server will all of a sudden start creating brand new charting information. If you have been through this a couple of times, you'll notice that the charts just stop for one agent and then you need to find out where these charts begin again, they start somewhere else. So that directory is really important to keep in a, a well-known good location that will never change. And then there's a system daemon directory and this stores daemon related data that must not survive reboots. And one of the important files that should not survive reboots are lock files. Agents come up, daemons come up, API things come up. And in order to make sure that multiple versions of the same thing aren't running at the same time, there is a lock file. And so for example, if your system crashes and comes back up and it detects that the lock file is still there, then it won't start because it may think to itself, well, there's somebody else trying to do the same thing. And so it's really best to put the daemon directory, the system daemon directory in a location that won't survive a reboot. And in the case of Ubuntu, if you're running this as a non-privileged user, you may want to consider a location like slash temp, but slash temp may not necessarily work because on some systems like CentOS or Fedora, that directory remains the same all the time. And so one of the things that we're trying to do to make Patu more resilient is to have in the installation script the requirement for you to run the installation script as sudo and that the system di daemon directory gets put in the correct location, which is uh, the var run directory, which does not survive reboots on any type of Linux system. And so therefore, though the daemon may be running under the name Peter, my name is Peter, I log in and I set up my system using the name Peter, etc. It will automatically change the ownership of that particular location to be owned by Peter when the system reboots. There are no more lock files, the daemons start up and they work. And we're trying as much as possible to make Patu run as a system daemon. We need to make it as easy to install Patu as if you are using apt, apt get install or dpackage or RPM or one of those things. It needs to just work. And so that's coming and that's part of the Palisades Foundation's uh, Calico Challenge this year. And then finally, there's a cache directory. And all the systems have a cache directory. And in there, for example, if an agent tries to contact the central API server and it cannot contact it, then that data that it holds in memory could potentially get stale. Right? And we don't want to be in a situation where that, that data gets lost. And so the agent will store the JSON data in a subdirectory under cache directory, generates a cache directory with the same name as the agent ID and dumps JSON files in there. And then the next time it pulls for information and then at the same time, immediately after tries to contact the central API server, if the API server is up and running, then it posts that most current piece of JSON data. And then the very next thing that it'll do is check in its cache directory to see if there are any other files that can be sent. And then it will read those files, send them, and then purge the information in the cache directory. All right, so I mentioned this before, the agent IDs, they're created automatically, and I told you where they were stored um, prior to this. So this, this slide is a little redundant at the moment. So let's talk about agents and what they do and what they don't do. Agents collect data as key value pairs. And so for example, you are you want to get information based on um, climatic conditions. Uh, you will write an agent to query a thermometer, for example. You, you would have a key value of temperature. The value would be 39.4 in this particular case. And if that's a very fancy thermometer, it'll also have humidity, and that will also provide you with a value of 27.8% relative humidity. If you look inside Patu shared, the repository, there's a, a file in there called variables.py. And in there, you will see objects called, one of them is called a data point object. And so what you do is that you instantiate the data point object with the key 
of temperature, the, the, the word temperature, and the value of 39.4. And then you create another data point object of humidity with the key value of community and the other one a value of 27.8. That data point object, the moment it's created, it creates, it also has inside of it uh, a variable called timestamp. And so when the agent eventually posts these data points to the remote location, the, the API knows the temperature, the humidity, and the timestamp at which that value was created. Uh, in addition to the data point being an object, you can also add metadata. A data point value uh, object, just having temperature and humidity is not enough. Where did it, where did you get this information from? So you could create another key and say that it's the city was Kingston, the level of cloudiness on that particular day. So you could have cloudiness and the value of between one to 10, all these other pieces of information that would be interesting. And that's why when you look at, at the moment, when you look at the Patu web pages and you click through you will see what looks like this extraneous data that's there. And that extraneous data is there just to help you to identify the unique pieces of information when to see whether the information that's there is what you want to look at. And so we're going to need to figure out ways of filtering by metadata, et cetera. So the whole idea is to try and have uh, agents that are very lightweight. So the, eight, the data points from the same location, let's just call a location being a target. Uh, so for example, you have an agent and you are polling data from Norman Manley International Airport. If there's another object in there that says you instantiate it with the, the target being NMIA. It could be UWI, it could be UTEC, it could be CMU, wherever the, the location is. All of them have the same data gathering type of, of object at the remote end. They all have the same type of electronic thermometer. The agent is out there polling each of them. And so that agent, that's the, the temperature monitoring agent, will now have multiple targets, one of them the NMIA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you will create a target object and you will add the data points into that target object. The agent will then aggregate all those target objects into its own agent object and then from there post that data. You will have the data points that would be added to a target data point object. Multiple target data point objects would be added to an agent polled data object. And then that agent pulled data object is then unwrapped and then sent as JSON to the central server. All of these objects and how they work with their various methods are in the Patu shared repository. There's a file called variables.py and you'll see all of these classes defined. And you'll notice that every one of those classes has a method called add. And so the target data points object you add data points into it the agent pulled data object you add target data points into it and then all of those things get uh, sent as json to the central server agents are persistent and resilient as i was mentioning before agents periodically pull their targets for data the json is stored in the cache directory as i mentioned and then we have the lock files as i spoke before there's some important agent links Let's talk about the API server. There are three big demons that are in the, uh, on, the, on the API server. One of them is the agent API, and all it does is just collects data. Uh, it listens on a, a well-known port. It does basic JSON integrity checks, and it just stores the data immediately into the cache directory. It does no authentication verification at the moment. It does no decryption because there's no encryption at the moment. None of that stuff. It just dumps the data straight to the disk. And the reason for this is because we all know that databases are never always there. There may be, you may be on a bad network. There may be maintenance on it. On it, You may forget to start your database. Various things happen. But if the system is up and running, you can be almost assured that local storage is available. So we just dump it straight onto this thing and make something else later on that is more aware of the database uh, handle that database connection. Put to API Agent D runs with multiprocessing. So if you have a six core system that's running, if you do a PSAUX, you will see six of these agents running at the same time. So it tries as much as possible to maximize the, res the resources available to it. The next thing is the ingester. There's a Patu ingestedd daemon, and it runs also. 
it periodically reads the data that's in the cache directory for the JSON files received by the API uh, daemon. So I remember I spoke about the fact that if you look in the, uh, the cache directory, you'll see subdirectories with long hexadecimal strings, which are the agent IDs. But there's also in that directory, you will probably see a subdirectory called patu API agent D. That is where the API stores its data. That's where the ingester looks for data that has been sent to it from the various uh, from the various agents. Now, if you decide to install Patu, Patu Agent, and Patu Shared, and all of these things all on the same system, all of these files will appear to be in the same location. But if you have a distributed system, the Patu API D server in the center may only have the, the single directory inside the cache in the cache directory. You have to take these things into context, but this is just for your information. So that's what the ingester does. And then of course there's the web API and that provides data to external clients using GraphQL. All right, so let's go on to the database structure. Patu uses a, a well-known ORM called a SQL Alchemy. And what that does is it, it has a number of features, which I will explain later on in the documentation. But there's a file in the input to called models.py. And in there, you will see a bunch of classes. There's a class called data. There's a class called pairs. There's a class called um, agent, a number of classes. And each of those classes, if you take a look at it, defines a database table. And you will see things like the primary key, foreign keys, and various other things. I'm not going to go and sh show you what all of those are. I'm just going to explain to you what each of the tables does and the classes that are handled by it so that you get a, an idea as to the operation behind the scenes. So there's a table called agent. And as I mentioned before, each agent generates a permanent and unique ID that it sends in the JSON payload. And in the JSON, there's also target information that's sent. So there's the agent and there's a target in the JSON and underneath the target key, there's all the data points. And so the agent table stores the agent ID in combination with the target name. So the agent ID and the target create a unique key because the agent of a, of, a, of a particular ID could be, like I mentioned before, it could be polling UWI, it could be polling UTEC, CMU, NCU, wherever. And so therefore that unique combination is provides a unique ID that is referenced through the Patu environment. And then there's a pair table. So remember I was telling you that Patu uses key value pairs. All the key value pair metadata is stored inside this table. So we mentioned before that the temperatures could be coming from the city key of Kingston, the city key of UTEC, the city key of CMU or wherever it is. All the key pair value metadata that has ever been seen by Patu is stored in this table. And the data point objects also have some hidden metadata inside there as well, which is stored in this table. And then there's a glue table. And what that does is that it tries to track unique combinations of metadata sent in the data points. So for example, you may be sending information to the Patu server and you have a key value pair of city and Kingston, another key value pair of cloudiness and the value. And then you may have uh, and other information, this glue table, tracks the various combinations of metadata that has ever been sent to it. Some data points may send two pieces of metadata that are unique. Some, some may send five or six or seven or whatever it is. This table keeps track of that, those various lists, whether they'll be long or short. And then I'm going to show you how the two things, um, how, how this ties into a, a unique thing. Because you're going to be saying to yourself, well, I could be having uh, a, an agent sending information about data points or key value pairs of Kingston and cloudiness that are the same for humidity and could be the same for temperature, right? Because we're not storing the actual key and the value of the of the actual data point, which are storing the metadata. And then you'd say, but there's duplication in that. Well, the next table helps 
get around that problem. And so what happens is that the data point table is the table that creates that uniqueness. It says this particular entry in the data point table is tied to an agent target combination and it's also tied to the glue and that helps it to create a unique id for the data point this agent target information with these particular combinations of metadata data points created a unique entry that's going to be used for storing data in the data table for the device there's one other key that I failed to mention, the pairs table stores all the metadata, but it also stores the key of the data point. So say, for example, we're doing temperature and the value is 37.7. There's a key called patu underscore key, and the value for that is temperature. And so now you're going to have temperature plus all the metadata, and that temperature key value is tied to the agent target combination. And so the agent provided this particular unique string of data point metadata plus the key value of temperature. And that unique combination is a single entry in the data point table. Every single point that every single agent is polling is stored in this table. And of course, there's the data table, which keeps track of the data point ID that was mentioned in the previous table, and then the actual value. And then it extracts the timestamp that was sent to it in the data point. And so that table, I think, has no more than about two or three columns. The, the value and the data point ID, it may have one more thing. I'm, I'm not sure, but it's very, very straightforward. People would say to me, why did you choose using a MySQL database for the PATU or maybe a PostgreSQL database? And the reason for that is because we're using very, very structured data. With that rigidity, it allows us to use the indexing and some of these other things of a relational database. In other types of environments where you could be doing uploading of photographs or documents and all that, a, a database of, of a RDB, RDBMS may not be the right solution. But in this case, it's very rigid, so we decided to go with that. Also, because we're using MySQL, people in Jamaica will be able to understand it. Uh, students will be able to understand it. Uh, MySQL has a lot of third third-party libraries in Python that could be used. And so therefore, that's part of the reason why we decided to go with this methodology. So there's a agent group table. This is used to group agents with the same names. And the reason for this is because of multilingual support for Patu. So there's an agent translation table. So remember I told you that you have the agent table with the agent names in there, but the agent name could be, like I mentioned before, it could be temperature monitor as the agent name, or it could be like anything. And when the agent is instantiated or the agent object is instantiated when it's being sent, the data just before it's being sent to the central Patu server, it takes whatever string you use to instantiate it and makes it all lowercase, it changes all spaces into underscores. So it creates a, a unified, codified agent name. And the reason for this is because thinking ahead, the question now becomes this product or this service or this code needs to be able to be used by people who speak English, speak Spanish, speak whatever language. And so therefore, if we can use that agent name and have a translation way of saying this agent key value or agent name value in English should be temperature monitoring system. And then if it's in Spanish, should it be something like um, medidor de temperaturas, de las temperaturas. And so therefore, people from different languages would then be able to, to be able to use it. And so it adds a degree of complexity for the DevOps person that's managing it in the beginning, but then the end user has a much more pleasant experience. If you take a look at the database tables, you'll notice that all the strings in the database are using Unicode. They're not using ASCII. And the reason for that is because we could be using kanji script, we could be doing stuff in Mandarin, it could be Thai or Arabic, etc. There's key value pairs. You could have a city as a metadata key. City in English is city, 
but that key may need to be translated into Ciudad for Spanish or Cidade for Portuguese or Ville for French. And so therefore, we need to make sure, that, once again, that if somebody is seeing all the metadata that is being presented in, in the web browser, uh, that they also have the ability to say, okay, I understand what's happening. And so one of the things, one of the challenges that we're going to have with Patu is to try and figure out if we're going to be supporting multilingual things, how can we import translation files into the browser? How can we import them from the CLI? How can we add them one by one? That sort of thing. And this is part of the reason, the rationale for some of these tables. Uh, on the surface, it seems like an additional layer of complexity, but if we want it to be multilingual, then this is a one, of, one of the ways it can be done. If you guys on the call think of other ways in which it could be done in, in a better schema, let's hear about it. This is another table for translations. And you may wonder why is there another table uh, for keep your translations and translations for groups and why you want to group agents with the same name into a different translation grouping. And so I'll give you a very good example. If you are going to be monitoring a Linux system and you and you write a uh, agent to be pulling all the various bits and pieces of Linux information and those Linux uh, pieces of information are in well-known locations in which there's no customization, it is always going to be the, the CPU count, the memory, free memory, and all of those things. And all of those things are always called those values in terms of the, the location that you want to query the information from, and the values always are of a certain type. Then you can have all your Linux agents using the same translation. But the world doesn't work like that in all cases. In the world of electromechanical systems, there is a protocol called BACnet, and there's a protocol called Modbus. The protocols don't really matter. But what can happen is that in a manufacturing environment, you may have multiple sensors along a path or in the manufacturing area. And in this section of your manufacturing plant, location number one may be temperature, but using the same Modbus agent to monitor a separate part of the plant, ID number one could be not necessarily a temperature monitor, it could be a pressure monitor. All of a sudden, you have two agents that are polling using the same protocol, but the addresses at the far end are the same, but they're polling different types of data. One is pressure, one is temperature. And so therefore, you may find yourself in a situation where you may need to group agents according to whether they're monitoring the same sorts of things. It's easy with Linux. It's not so easy with some of these other things. And so therefore, that's why there are a number of layers of abstraction. This is a key important aspect of it. Translations for Patu to be universally acceptable are going to have to be a part of life. And then, of course, there's the language table. It's a very simple table. It probably only has one or two lines in there, uh, language code and the description of the language. The primary key of that is used for all the translations mentioned previously. Any questions on the tables before I start talking about optimizations? I think uh, has what I've been saying, is it, is it clear? Yes, it's clear. It's just a lot. I'm going to one. Yeah, go ahead. Next oh, okay. So, um, considering that um, Patu might become multilingual, um, as it relates to that insertion script, would you still keep the prompt where um, you get to choose a language, so even though we're going for like a promptless insertion script, or would that be like a setting you can change later on? That's a good question. Uh, I believe at the moment the default is EN for English. If the configuration class doesn't see a language definition in there, so uh, you can use that default. If you're going to be doing a automated installation, then it would be assumed that the configuration file in that particular case would have had the, the language code put inside the the, uh, the configuration file ahead of time. But if there's no if there's no configuration file, then you choose English. Or if you're going to be doing promptless, you could probably have in the installation script install space dash dash language en for example and so therefore it'd be still prompt less but you'd provide that information from the command line ahead of time okay i get that 
Okay. All right. Uh, Any so other what about, uh, so what if we, in the case of a language, what about getting yeah. the language from the system? But then it would still prompt um to choose like a preferred language, but the first thing, one of the first thing it is to try to get the language from the system. Good point. The operating system on with this thing could work, may not necessarily support that. Um, you're, at the moment, we're using Linux, and there may be some strange operating system. It could be a Internet of Things, and it could be done in um, ROM or something. That is a very good point. That could be considered. You could potentially have a situation where Patu could be consolidating data from multiple countries, and that may need to be considered as well. It, it's a valid point. That could be something that we could consider. I'm going to continue. So there's the technology. We are using Python and we're doing RDBMS systems. And there are well-known tools in Jamaica. If there's a database administrator or someone who wants to be a database administrator, there's lots and lots of stuff that's out there. It's not as new and fa fabulous and fantastic like um, Firebase, in which people be more scared of stuff. MariaDB, MySQL are well known. Every WordPress website out there uses Maria, MariaDB or MySQL. It should be relatively easy to convince people that they don't need a maintenance contract to use MySQL. And there's lots of stuff that's out there. These are part of the reasons why we chose some of this stuff and on top of that it's open source code and uh, it's free for people to use and as i mentioned before we chose an rdbms because it uses key value for pairs it's very highly structured data each entry is a very small amount of data there's graphql which is something that is being used as for the api and if you're familiar with rest as an api you will know that with rest you have various types of routes you have let's say for example we're going to be doing data point you and you want to get information about data point number one, you would have the URL and then a slash data point slash one which for data point number one, and you get all the information for data point number one. And then you can use um, query strings to do filtrations and things like that. But it means that every time you want to do a query on a data point value, or you want to do any sort of filtering, you need to do a manual intervention on the side of the API and write yet more code. GraphQL provides you with the ability to have a single route and the filtration is done by the web developer. I'm going to try and show you how, that's, how that works um, very shortly, but it, it makes life a lot easier. The web developer can create their own custom types of queries without having to deal with all this other stuff at the at the far end makes development faster graphql was recommended to me about two years ago by a calico challenge student and then there's sql alchemy which is the um, the abstraction layer from the uh, from the database into python looking objects and so as i mentioned before in, when you look at the sql alchemy file inside of inside of patu you'll see a class for every single table and the tables are named agent or data point or whatever it may be and the uh, advantage is that when you're writing the python code with sql alchemy you don't have to know mysql syntax you don't have to know sql like syntax you don't have to know postgres syntax you just need to know sql alchemy syntax and when you send that sql alchemy stuff to the um, the database engine to get information out of it, it does all of that translation from SQL Alchemy into MySQL statements or into Postgres statements, all of that behind the scenes. You can run Patu in theory on MySQL, MariaDB, and Postgres with only changing a single location inside all the code. And that single location could be a configuration parameter, for example. At the moment, it only supports MySQL and MariaDB, but there's no reason why we couldn't try to see whether we could get it to work with Postgres using a configuration file parameter or SQLite. And when the installation script runs, it actually reads the models file that all of these classes are stored in and uses that information to create the database. Other thing that SQL Alchemy does is that it also has a means of creating a very small number of collection of connections, even at large volumes. And I'll tell you why this is really, really super important. 
the core code for Patu was inspired by code that me and my team have written for the data center that I run. And we monitor uh, electricity and network capacity or network usage uh, across multiple customers. And we are monitoring at the moment, maybe around see, maybe about six or 7,000 data points. Uh, we're monitoring that every five minutes. And when we want to do the updates to the database, we do it in batch. And so therefore every 15 minutes, we, are, uh, we want to connect to the database and send it somewhere in the region of 15 to 20,000 data points. And if you do that, all at once using multiprocessing, you know, you start spinning up things and start sending data to the central database. All of a sudden you have thousands and thousands and thousands of connections hitting the database at the same time. And if your database is in incapable or has a low capacity for connections, it's going to just fail. But with SQL Alchemy, you can force all the SQL Alchemy queries to go through a pool of connections. And in, in this particular case with Patu, I think the default is 20 or 30 connections. And though you're doing thousands and thousands of database updates, you're only doing that through 20 connections. Database server can handle high transaction volumes. It just cannot handle high connection counts. And then finally, we have integration into GraphQL. So you can, you can tell the GraphQL um, Python library to inspect the SQL Alchemy configuration and create routes and uh, filters and those sorts of things automatically. And so you don't have, so every time you add a new table or column or whatever it is, GraphQL automatically knows about it and bang, it's right there. And so you just do your modifications one time, and in theory, everything is happy. So I mentioned this before, we have the API in the ingester. The API focuses on writing agent data quickly to files on disk. There's no need for database connectivity to accept data, which makes it a little more resilient. Uh, the ingester does batch optimization of sending data to the database when it's doing the data point up updates. It tries to collect them together to make it more efficient. And then it uses multiprocessing for speed as well. By default, when you do a PSA UX and you're looking at the ingester, it just looks like one entry that's going on. But the moment it detects files inside the cache directory, it spins up as many instances as there are CPU cores and it starts to do the processing. I've thought of using threading as well. So there could be multiprocessing with threading as well. One of the issues that I found with Python threading is that when things break, it's very, very hard to troubleshoot. Uh, there are ways in which it can be done. It's hard. It's, it's, it, the exceptions just get disappear into unknown memory space. You can't see them. There are ways in which you can get around it. And but one of the advantages of multiprocessing is that you can multiprocess uh, a function. And so therefore, if you want to troubleshoot the function, you can send the data to the individual function rather than going through the, the multiprocessing function that calls the single function. You can just go to the single function straight and put the data values in there and see whether things break. So it, it provides a, a degree of um, better troubleshooting um, at the expense of uh, probably processing power. At some time in the future, we may want to do multiprocessing and multithreading. At the moment, we have bigger, bigger things to concentrate on. And so therefore, we're going to put that one on the back burner. In the log directory that I'd mentioned before, there are three files. There's the Patu log, the Patu API, and the Patu daemon log file. And one of the ways in which you can do troubleshooting is to run the tail dash f command. So you'll do tail space dash f space Patu log. A tail dash normally shows you the last 10 items in a file. But with tail dash f, it will show you the, the last 10 items of the file and wait to see if there's anything else coming. And if, if that file, new data goes to that file, then it'll be appended to the bottom of the tail-f output. You can run the tail-f command and then 
hit enter a couple of times and create a little, a little gap and just use that as a means of separating what used to be there and what's coming up. And so therefore you could potentially, for example, if you're having an issue with the ingester, you could tail patoo.log with tail-f, hit enter a couple of times in one window and then um, open up a window, another window and restart the ingester. And then all of a sudden you'll see the new code stuff that's happening. And I'm gonna show you some of this as a general troubleshooting guide, which I think would be very helpful. And so there are three files that you need to take a look at. And so best practices. And, and going back to troubleshooting, as much as possible, check the logs. There's a lot of logging in Patu. If you set the default level to debug, there's huge amounts of information that's there that you can use for your troubleshooting. Um, it will help you get an idea as to what may be wrong. If, for example, your daemon doesn't come up, more than likely the reason for it is in one of those log files. Um, it may be a well-known error in which put, there's a, 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 a well-known syslog entry, or it could be just a crash with the exceptions that you'd normally see when, put, when Python crashes. But check those three files, something's going to be there. Almost guaranteed it's going to be there. So be fearless, take a look at that section. Okay, so some best practices. One of the things that we have noticed when people install Patu is that they install it as a, as a regular user. And we really need to make sure that people install it as a system daemon. Because if it runs as a system daemon, then the lock file will be stored in a system directory. And then when it reboots, you, the daemons will just automatically come up without people having to scratch their heads. So it's really trying to think of ways in which we can, we can make this better. There's documentation as to how to set up system daemons. If you haven't set it up yet, um, it's not too late. Your existing configuration files can be in the same location. Your, your repositories can be the same location on disk. Just take a look at the documentation, run your Patu as a system daemon as much as you can. File locations, I strongly recommend that you don't install Patu in, in your downloads directory or documents directory. Put them somewhere else. Uh, files will start coming in. If you're, if, and most of the people that are on this call are using, are learning about Patu because they want to be developers. And the last thing we want is to all of a sudden find ourselves having Excel spreadsheets in the repository. So take it out of, take it out of those locations. Um, the next thing is make sure that if you can, make sure that the log directory, the system daemon directory, daemon directory, and the configuration file is outside of your Python code tree. There are directories in the in in each of the repos for log for logs and system and for daemons and cache and all of that. They're there as a convenience, as a last resort, so that if people just use the installation defaults that will be stuck in those particular locations. Um, one approach that we are considering is that you can create a slash opt slash per two directory. And then underneath there, you can have an et cetera directory. Underneath opt per two, you can have a daemon directory, a log directory, maybe a per two directory, a per two agents directory, et cetera. Per two really isn't a desktop or a laptop application. It's an application for DevOps team. Um, if you're running Patu as, as your regular user, um, in my case, Peter, make sure that you have a bash profile file and it includes these lines. Um, and in this particular case, you'll see that the Patu config directory is out at, uh, slash op slash Patu slash et cetera. But if it's in your home directory, it'll be slash home slash username slash whatever. But just make sure that you've configured this so that, and the reason for that is that every time you uh, start a new terminal session or you reboot your system, the Patu config their parameters already set. You don't have to keep doing it manually every single time. And uh, that inconvenience just goes away. Yeah. Can I get a little clarity on like um, running as a system, like running system demons when you run Patu? In Linux systems, when Linux systems boot, they look in a well-known directory location for configuration files for daemons. 
and they look for those files and they take the parameters from those files to start the daemons. There's a script in all the individual Purdue repositories that installs the system daemon for you. You're going to have to run it as sudo, but if you do, uh, if you do ls slash, in, in this particular case, I've got, I've got everything in, um, in this particular directory. There's a, there's a file called install systemd.py, and you have to run that file as in, in sudo uh, to put the configuration files in, a, in the right location in systemd. So if I do slash help, you will see that you have to provide the configuration directory, the username under which the stuff is going to be installed under group. So there's documentation as to how to use this. I'm just showing you that there's, you don't have to do this manually. It's, it's done already. And this script will take a look at files in this directory, which are template files for each of the various uh, daemons that may be running. So you can see here's one for Pato APID service and whatever. And it will take these template files and make modifications to them and the modifications that it'll make is that it'll add the configuration directory it'll add the username it'll add the group to the template files and put them in the correct location where is that correct location so if i do an ls slash etc slash system b slash system and i think it's multi-user targets there's a whole bunch of files and these are all the files that Linux will use it will go to a reference when they are when it's starting up. These are the files that are going to be started when Linux starts up. So you can see here, there's this SSH service. There's a WPA supplicant, which is the Wi-Fi thing. Syslog that starts. There's um, oh, and look here, there's Patu APID service. All right, so let's take a look at what that looks like. And then cat. This is the configuration file that Linux will then read to figure out what things are happening. You will see that it automatically sets the environment variable to the right location as to where it, the configuration files are located. This is the script that must be run when you do service patu underscore apid start. This is the script that must be run when you do stop. This is the one that you must be run when you do restart. This is the user that it needs to be run as. And the, those are the parameters that were sent uh, from the command line when you're getting that stuff set up. This particular section is in the wrong section. It should be up here. This was done in a, in a, a, at a time when I wasn't 100% sure of myself. But this should be actually up here. Uh, and it should really say after equals network.target space MySQL space MySQL D etc cetera, etc cetera. and the reason for that is because we don't want patu to start before mysql or mariadb we want to make sure that those things are running first and then they start up the running of that script and getting those things set up are important to make sure that patu runs as a daemon um, use the very latest version of Patu that's from the main, the master branch of the existing Patu uh, repository. Do the same thing for the daemon, for the uh, for the API, sorry, for the agents. Do the same thing for the web thing. Make life a lot easier. Set your upstream to the Patu Foundation repositories fetch your upstream, merge with your upstream, and run, and then run the script. And you should be OK. Your laptop should be able to reboot without a problem. And why will it reboot without a problem? Because it's going to be using the var run patu location for the lock file. And the system daemon has a well-known directory, as I mentioned before, called var run for the, which stores temporary files. And this particular parameter is relative to var run. So it, because it says patu, it doesn't mean it's just putting it in patu and nothing else. It's putting it actually in slash var run patu. So if I do an ls slash var run 
Uh, it's not in this one. So if I do an ll slash var run, there should be a MySQL, MySQL there. You can see there's a PID file and a socket file that's there. And so that's a well-known location. And if this thing were installed correctly, that's where it would be located. Any other questions? Oh, no. OK. Let's talk about the, the variables pi directory uh, file that I was talking about before. All right. So I'm going to go straight down and take a look at data point. So this, when you, when you look at the documentation as to how to set up an agent, there is a section that says you instantiate a data point. And so this is where the data point class comes from. And as you can see, there's the key, there's the value. Sorry. And the moment that you create this data point, as you can see, it automatically creates a timestamp. Um, it it allows you to put in a timestamp value in the event that the timestamp of the time of the instantiation of the object is not the right timestamp. If, if you could have, you could have got this data three days ago, and so therefore you want to use a timestamp from three days ago instead of the automatically created timestamp. So that's the reason why we have this. Um, it defaults to assuming that the data that comes in is integer. Uh, we may want to change that to float because it's um, we have floating values if we can, so that may be something that we may want to change. And then it tries to, it does some basic checks, etc. Um, this RPR representation is that it allows you. So, for example, if you've got uh, a data point object and you you know you know when you're in Python and you type. Uh, print an object and it just gives you like a, a cryptic message like angle bracket some value and then some sort of string and then close bracket um, that that's that sometimes is not very useful with the underscore 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 rpr underscore underscore you can convert that into a more meaningful name from pi um pi two underscore shared import Right, and then uh, let's just say data point equals uh, my key. We're just going to say Peter, and my value is going to be um, twenty twelve. Okay. Now, when I do print data point. It says normally it would have curly brackets and some some funny thing. It actually gives you the values, right? It says it's a data point of value key. The value is this. The data type is ninety nine, which is integer. It's the timestamp at which it was created and whether it's valid or not. All of that, if you notice, is here in this representation. See, I get I represent the printable value, the set the value, the data type, the reference, and you can see there's a key equals, the value equals, the data type equals, timestamp equals, right there. Right there, right? Um, and all of these classes have have RPRs or repers inside of there, so it makes troubleshooting easier. All right, so here's the class, as I mentioned before, here's a data point class. And then from here, we have uh, an add. And so therefore, you can add metadata. So you can see here's add, and you can add various items. It checks to see whether the item is a list. If the item is a list, it makes it into a list. And then it checks to see whether the item is of a class metadata. And if it's not a metadata value, it just ignores it and then just goes on to the next one. So where's this metadata thing from? Well, where do you get that from? Well, here it is. Here's the metadata. So there's another class. And so, for example, what you can do in my previous example is that I can do something like this. I can do, um, okay, and then when I do data point dot add metadata. And so when I do uh, print data point, okay, and then you can do, um, and then if I do metadata, there it is. 
you can see the key value pair of metadata. And so if I add another one, I can do um, do address, and then I can change this to somewhere. And then if I can now, I can now do another add. Okay. And then now when I do print data point metadata, there should be two entries. As name Harrison address somewhere. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go into every one of the classes. I just want to let you be aware that that's what's happening when you do an add to the metadata. And then similarly, you, when you add data points to the posting data data points, the add is doing the same thing. And then the agent pulled the data, unwraps all the, the data and the metadata and the metadata inside the metadata, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then converts that into JSON. So that's what's happening behind the scenes. You don't necessarily have to know exactly all of that, but if you're interested in how it works and how they all integrate with one another, this is just a key concept for, for per two. Any questions there? Okay, let me go to per two and um, specifically, and then go to per two, go to DB for database. And then here we see models. And this is the models where SQL Alchemy does its thing. And you can see there's a whole bunch of SQL Alchemy imports right here. Um, and you will see that there's a pool, a database pool, and I'm, I'm going to talk about that uh, shortly. And uh, as you can see, here is the language class, which defines the table called pt underscore table. So the table name in the database is called pt underscore language, but all your queries are handled using the term language. And then here's a, there's a column called IDX language, a column called code, there's a column called name, column, column called enabled. And similarly, here's another table that's, that is re referenced in object land as agent xlate, but this is the actual table name. And then you can see, you can define the unique key in which is the combination of the IDX language and program, agent program, et cetera. So this is where all the database tables are defined. And you will also see that there are some uh, relation, interrelationships that are happening here. Okay. And I'm going to talk about these interrelationships a little later. The SQL Alchemy also keeps track of database connections. In this init.py, that's where it's done. So there's a thing called a pool. And you essentially create a URL for connecting to the MySQL database. Um, you do some protective me methodologies, but essentially what, what happens here is that you create the pool. And this, this is interesting um, information. Don't, don't take this too literally just yet, but essentially you create a pool and you will say, okay, where is, where is this pool used? Let's just take a look at a query in um, the two. Okay, so here, for example, we're doing a database query and you'll notice that it's looking at, it's doing a filter based on agent.idx. And so in the model, okay, in the model there's agent.idx. And so that's what's happening there. And you're filtering where agent.idx is some integer value. And so it's, it's using a, a, like a pseudo language, which is fairly easy to understand. And then you'll notice that it says db.dbquery. Where's that coming from? Well, there's a db file and in there, there's db query. And db query is using the pool that was created over here. All of Patu's database queries to use db query or db modify. And by using db query or db modify, you're automatically using the pool. And because now you don't have to do typical SQL uh, select statements like select IDX underscore agent where IDX underscore agent equals blah, blah, blah. You can do it this way and you can make sure that you don't have that, have those issues. I'm showing you this information so that you, you're you not afraid when you're looking at this code and saying, I, I don't, I cannot put the, the various pieces together. This is 
how that particular uh, aspect works. Any questions before we get to GraphQL? Let's talk about GraphQL. All right, so there's a well-known location where you can actually practice with GraphQL out on the internet. This Palisades calico.palisades.org slash patu slash api slash v1 slash web slash igraphql this document tells you how graphql interacts with the um, the models file that i showed you with all the various classes each class being a uh, database table one of the things that i wanted to show you is um, there's a file called schemas you don't have to read a lot into schemas but i just want to show you that there are some queries in here that's called all glues and all data points which will show you all the data points that are available all the pairs that are available all the data that's available all the languages that are available let's just do a query on all language okay so we're going to do this they're all language and you can see that language has idx language has code it has name it has enabled so let's take a look at that you start out your query with graphql with um, open and close brackets. And remember, I told you about all language, right? So when you type all language, it automatically sees it because it's in that schema file. With GraphQL, every time there's a list, it's called an edge. So we can say there are edges. So we're expecting a list. And in each of those list edges, there's a node. And what exactly is a node? A node is just a column. So let's see whether we can get all the IDX language values out of the language table. So we can just type IDX, look at that, IDX language. And there is JSON data that is returned to you that shows you all the IDX language stuff. Now, say for example, I want to also see the code for that language, right? And that code is here. And I do play button where it says code is English. And I can do when was the last time this, this record was created? And then when was this record modified? There it is. You can see this happening automatically. If you're doing a RESTful API, you would have to do this manually. You'd have to do slash this, slash that with query strings, etc. This just allows you to do this very, very quickly without too much of an issue. That's it on the language side. Let's take a look at what this can do with some other things. Again, from scratch. All my agent, oops, all my agent translations. And then remember, I was telling you there are edges because they're multiple, and then there's a node. And what do we have inside of there? Let's see um, agent program. Let's take a look at all the agent programs that are out there. Look, I have put to autonomous D and spoke D and this guy, this guy, all of these guys that are operating. And then um, let's take a look at their IDX. You can translate. That's their translation table entry, translation of that name there. That's the translation of that particular thing, whether that thing is enabled, there's enabled. And then now I can do filtering. Say I just want the last, the last one or the last two. I can type last colon two, and I should only get five and six, which is these last two here. See, five and six. Let's, let's use the IDX translate equals two. So, IDX translate, set that to two, and then we should get a two agent OS spoke D and this guy. Reason why, and there we have it, there, there's a number two. Um, and so let's, let's take a look at data, all data edges, which is all the data that's inside the table and the node and I want to get um, the value, maybe the timestamp and the IDX, IDX data point. This is going to be a huge undertaking because we're getting all the data and it's going to be the entire database coming back. And so that's probably going to take a long time, which is not a good idea. So how do you get around some of this problem? So let's do um, a filter. Let's get the very, the very first IDX data point. So number one, 
Okay, so here are, here's all the data in the database where the IDX data point is one. Let's take a look at IDX data point number one. So we can do all data points, all data points. And we can do edges and then node and um, IDX data point. And uh, those are all the data points. And let's just filter this out such that the IDX data point is one. And so I'm going to try and show you the power of GraphQL in terms of getting additional information. So um, under here, we may have uh, here's the agent that created that data point. All right, and then underneath here, we may want to get um, uh, agent pool target. We can get some more information here. Um, we may want to also get uh, pairs polling interval. This is the information that's there. And so this data point, you can do one single query and know what agent actually um, provided with information. You can do various types of queries on the database using different types of filters. And all of this can be done without having to go back and forth with um, REST. And that makes this thing a much more um, user-friendly. So that's one of the reasons why we chose GraphQL. Um, you can take a look at the database structures to try, and you can look at the web, Patu web for some of its queries. So I'll give you an example of that. So for example, if we go to PySales Foundation, and we go to Patu Web, and you go to Patu Web, and uh, go to Web, and do some query stuff. I go here, and you can, as you can see, we are using um, various queries to get data out of the out of the database, and we're using these exact strings to get the data out of GraphQL. Uh, so let, let me give you an example here. Here's, here's one of the ones that we're using. And uh, we can put that straight into GraphQL here. Certify. There we go. OK. And so similarly, one of these IDs is uh, used up here, so we can do this, let's just take this information. I'm gonna put this in a separate file. So here's the agent ID. So we got the agent ID here, right? So let's take this agent ID. Um, and then go back here. Should be able to get information for this data point. As you can see here, here's the agent ID data point. Here's the glue, all that glue stuff that I was talking about. Here's the one key value for the for the glue table, the, the right. And so you can get all the information that you want that this agent is responsible for polling. This is one of the queries that is used on the home page of uh, Patu to get information out of it. So I strongly advise if you're if there's some people on the call that are doing stuff related to the mobile app development, take a look at the GraphQL queries that are coming out of Patu Web. If you're thinking of rewriting the front end to do React, here's some queries that you can use and you can practice with it on this well-known URL for now. But I'd suggest that you do the queries on your own systems, primarily because the code that this server is using is code from, I think, the master brand. You want to make sure that you're using uh, something that's more current. One question, though. Um, how is it that we're going to tackle, tackle unit testing? Good point. For what in particular? Uh, for the GraphQL stuff, 
Because if we're doing it for, um per user system, how is it that you're going to unit test? Like how how are you going to do a general unit test on whether the GraphQL queries work um when we do it in Python? Very good point. Uh, with Flask, with Python Flask, you can spin up uh, a, a test version of Flask just for the purposes of unit testing. And then you can query against that instance of Flask. You can set up the environment for that. And then you can do your GraphQL query because when the Python Flask thing comes up, it'll have all the same GraphQL routes and then you can do the query against it. And then from there, get information out of it. Now that I realize that there's a deficiency, I will try to at least create one uh, example of how that's done. And uh, you can use that as a template for all unit tests for Batu Web when the time comes. After not finding that file in the Batu Web section of the repositories for the Palisades Foundation, I remembered after answering that question that we do have an example of testing Flask with GraphQL, not in Patu Web, but under Patu. So if you go to the Palisades Foundation's main GitHub website and you click on Patu, like you see here, and then go from there, go to Tests, and then from there to Test Patu, Test API, Test Web, and then Test GraphQL, the example is here. You can see that you import Flask testing. Make this bigger. You can see that you import Flask testing and Flask caching. You set up your unit test. And then you create this app, which is what you see here. And this is where you create the Flask environment, you can set up a particular port that you may want and you import the app object or object that you'd be using for Flask. Just follow the example here and you should be well on your way to doing the testing. So you have to create this first. And instead of using the regular unit test um, parent, you have to use the live server test case. So follow this example, import the live server test case, make sure that you have this create app method inside your unit test. And then from there, all your testing will be against the new test version of Flask. So as, you, as we go down the page here, you can see in this particular example, Here's the query that you want to be doing in Flask. And then we do the get and we get the results as a graph query result, which is a big dict. And you can look at the same file and go down further and see how we get the data out of the GraphQL using uh, Python requests. So use this example. Once again, it's under Patu tests, test underscore Patu API web graphql.py. So let's just do that one more time. Patu tests, test Patu API web test graphql. Uh, another question for unit testing. Would you create the unit test first and or would you create it after writing the code itself? There, there are many philosophies as to how to do that. Some people write the unit test first, and then some people write the code after, and then they do it the other way. Some people write the code and then, then the unit test. Um, the, the way that I generally tend to do it is that I write a small amount of code that provides very basic functionality, and then I try to do the unit tests almost immediately. Once I reach what I think is a reasonable milestone for two or three hours or whatever, then I write a unit test to make sure my life is a lot easier. Um, and then just proceed onwards. Um, having, doing unit tests almost immediately as you're doing your coding makes life so much easier. I'll give you a very good example. Um, in my business, we just um, migrated our code base from um, a centralized system to a dis distributed system. 
we went through and did unit tests on the entire script. The unit tests take 45 minutes to run. They test almost every single function and class. And we knew that the code would just work. And we did some minor human testing and we rolled it out today without any errors. It makes the heart thumping so much less. It also makes the life of the DevOps people and the coders much easier because when things break after you do a code push, it's the developers and the DevOps people that have to stay up at night. And if the code is fully tested beforehand, then that headache and heartache just doesn't happen. I strongly, strongly, str I cannot say how strongly I recommend doing unit tests. I know that in the business world, quite often you don't have time for it. Your customers don't appreciate it. But for something like this, for Purdue, where we have time, we don't have people blowing down our necks to say that we have to do things on a particular time frame. We, we need to get some stuff done for the Calico Challenge, but get into the good habit from the beginning. You will have a lot more sleepful nights instead of sleepless nights.